and welcome to today's, to today's webinar hosted by the World Affairs Council of Orange County. We have a very timely, fascinating, and important subject today titled China's Rise, Rising Authoritarianism, Implications for Vulnerable Ethnic and Religious Groups and the Uyghur Genocide. I'm Rick Putnam, co-chair of the Programs Committee, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees, want to thank our members, supporters, and guests for joining us today. I'll introduce the program in a moment, but first, a couple of reminders. First, and as you know, we're a non-political, non-partisan organization, and we'll maintain that in our subject matter discussion and in the participation of our audience. So I thank you in advance for assisting us uh, with that. Uh, secondly, we want these sec sessions to be participatory, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and post your questions as we go through the program uh, to our speakers. We'll collect those for a Q&A session in the last uh, five to 10 minutes. And, and I'd certainly hope to get to each and every one. So with that, um, we are all too aware today of active authoritarian regimes synonymous with persecution of political, ethnic, or religious minorities in neighboring nations or perimeter regions, certainly such as in Eastern Europe today, and attempts to control those populations, eliminate their historical identities, and exert control, if not change the actual borders as well. Specifically as well, we also hear of China's repression of historical peace peoples in the East Turkestan region, although now it is not widely called by that name. Human rights, diplomatic, and corporate controversies swirl about, but for many in, of us in the West so far away, it's hard to get a firm grip on what's actually going on. Today, that will change for us. With this is Rusha Nabas, an ethnic Uyghur born in East Turkestan, who now resides in the US. In 2017, she founded the Campaign for Uyghurs, which, was, which focused on raising awareness of the Uyghur genocide, broadening uh, its network of awareness, and providing support to vulnerable women and youth. We have Rashan here to tell her story today, but among misfortunes she has endured is a missing sister, either jailed or disappeared by the Chinese Communist Party. But amongst her accomplishments, however, is the U.S. Forced Labor Prevention Act, passed by Congress on December 23, 2022, targeting imports compliance with humane labor practices. An amazing accomplishment, and one for which she has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Rashan, thank you so much for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you everyone for taking the time today um, to learn about one of the greatest uh, human rights atrocities of our times, um, the Uyghur genocide and the uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, war on freedom and on uh, democracy. The Chinese regime has engaged in a brutal and the uh, repressive campaign against my people, Uyghurs and the other Turkic people in our homeland, and one that has been called a genocide by many countries, um, the United States, and the, as well as an independent tribunal in the UK. The destruction of culture, separation of families, forced sterilization, forced abortions, forced labor, and the mass detention, all point towards China's objective of dest destroying the, uh, the Uyghur people. And I'm speaking today out of necessity, and I'm a mother um, who had a, a fulfilling life with a successful career before. And I never thought that I would quit my job and I become a, a full-time activist. I never thought that I would have to fight for my own sister's freedom while she's paying the price for my freedom of speech here in America as an American citizen. And I never thought in the 21st century, China would conduct a genocide against the innocent people, complete with concentration camps and slavery on our watch. 
the Chinese regime's genocide and the ultra nationalistic policies combined with racism and the cutting edge technology in our homeland have been confirmed not only through Beijing's own leaked documents, but hundreds of experts and the survivors' testimonies numerous times over. China's oppressive regime targets anyone who speaks out, who disagrees, or and uh, currently um, all Uyghurs are being labeled as Islamic terrorists because of our religion. And it has targeted um, the Uyghurs and the other people for just being different, just like it has done to the Tibetans, dismantling their right to worship and the, to their language and the culture. And the same as in Southern Mongolia. And if you look at uh, what happened last uh, few years, especially last two years in Hong Kong, destroying their democracies and cracking down their protests. Chinese Christians are persecuted for their beliefs as well. Is essence, um, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, fears freedom of belief, freedom of expression, or any kind of free thought, and that they will do anything to destroy it. So uh, we see this prominently in Uyghurs, and we know that China plans to, uh, China's uh, plans do not end with Uyghurs as our homeland is being used as a testing ground um, with the end goal of to total surveillance state. So um, they will continue to silence and intimidate those who are different from them and the, uh, who are entitled to live with basic human dignity and integrity. So it's up to us here to speak out, fight back, and we need to do it not only for the future of the oppressed and vulnerable people within China's borders, but the foundation of freedom, democracy, and human rights are being eroded by the authoritarian regime who demand obedience and exert control through force. So we cannot let that happen. I'm going to go through a brief presentation of who the Uyghurs are and the, um, where the East Turkestan is and what's happening today. Then I hope that you can take this information and share with others. And the, uh, hopefully that you feel empowered to take action. Um, let me share my screen. So these people you see, this is one of the pictures from one concentration camp. And the, all these people you see are innocent people and they are not charged with any crimes. They are fathers, brothers, they are teachers um, and the uh, business owners or just the a simple ordinary people who are trying to provide regular life for their children and for their wives, but they are taken as you see double barbed wires and armed guards holding them. The Uyghurs lived in Central Asia for thousands of years. Um, the Central Asia, which is a northwest part of China, a prominent center of commerce for more than 2000 years, as you see this picture on the right, it's one of the king from the Uyghur kingdom from seven, 744 till 1335, the, the Uyghur kingdom. And the uh, Manchus invaded our homeland in 1876 and renamed Xinjiang, which means new territory or new border in Chinese. And that name was given to our homeland in 1884. And now, even if we use the name East Turkestan, which is a symbolic, geographical, and the historical name for us as our ancestors uh, established independent uh, free country twice, once in 1933 and 1944. But when we call our homeland East Turkestan because we resent the name Xinjiang, which is uh, like, uh, uh, 
it's colonial name for us. And they also, uh, we take that as a derogatory term because it's our homeland. We have been living there for thousands of years. Why it's being called new territory. But when we use the name East Turkestan, the Chinese government tried to call us uh, separatists and the, uh, uh, you know, just the, trying to label us with all kinds of um, uh, false identities to discredit our work. And that's the map and the, some pictures of our beautiful homeland. It is um, located in the heart of Central Asia, as I mentioned earlier, bordered with Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and a little bit of Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. And it's sandwiched between high mountains and the desert, high mountains, the desert, and the high mountains. So three sets of beautiful high mountains and the two sets of large desert, which we all know what's desert, you know, um, filled with uh, petroleum and natural gas. Also population is um, even uh, Chinese government itself says our population is 12 million. I think I moved too quick from this. Um, 11 to 12 million. And the, the Uyghurs estimate the uh, Uyghur population is more than 20 million. But when this genocide started, genocidal policies started, um, this video in Al Jazeera, Victor Gao on the TV, he mentions when there was like a no relevance, he just throws the number six, seven million. His advisor for uh, Chinese Communist Party and Chinese government, and he leads one of the uh, uh, government uh, uh, sponsored government owned think tanks in Beijing. So if you, I'm going to play this video, he um, purposefully uh, throws the number six, seven million for workers. Well, I think uh, the reports uh, do not exist in line with the fact. So, makes you wonder why he uses that while the government claims the Uyghur population is 11, 12 million but he calls repeatedly twice on that the interview, six, seven million. As I mentioned earlier, you know, one third of China's natural gas and oil comes from our homeland. 40% of the coal reserves comes from East Turkestan and the um, majority of China's cotton comes from East Turkestan, which picked by Uyghur slaves by hand. The forced labor starts from there as young as the elementary school kids, high school students, and the university students. They forced to go to the field every year to harvest cotton. Recently, we had more than 2,800 faces, as you see on this screen, on the uh, leaked police files, unprecedented evidence that shows so-called re-education camps like the Chinese government claims or voc vocational training centers is complete lie. Look at these eyes, look at those faces. We've got about 250 people among from this 2,800 names and the pictures, over 50 years old, 60, 70 years old grandmas or grandfa grandfathers or young teenagers like you see in this picture, 14, 15 years old young girls. What kind of national security issue those people could bring to a country like China? The Xinjiang police files basically reaffirmed, it, it confirmed with images and the speeches, documents after documents and the spreadsheets with everything we have been saying for last several years. Um, you can see how 
this is targeted at the Uyghur people and how the uh, counties are feeling quotas to take the Uyghurs to the concentration camps. Some of them were charged for something that they have uh, done for like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. For example, if somebody had a Quran or some sort of religious video on their phone back in 2011 or 2012, they were arrested after the uh, 2016, 2017. If somebody was wearing hijab or hair scar, um, a head scar, like back in 2013 or 2010, they would have been taken for something they have done. You know. Also, they are all just the regular ordinary um, things in religion, ordinary practice, like praying, fasting, or wearing Islamic clothes, but the Chinese government calls them extremism or radicalized Islamic illegal activities. This is just the example of people's daily lives, ordinary daily lives. Um, Qin Chuanguo, the party secretary for Xinjiang, um, he points it out one, in one of his speeches when, when he says they, there, that's he's referring to the Uyghurs, that must break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and they break their origins. Some pictures from outside of the concentration camps. And those are the inside of the concentration camps. The two pictures on the right, that's the room that these people are going through indoctrination, going through um, studying the Chinese Communist Party, um, Xi Jinping's thoughts and the Chinese Communist Party ideologies. And then they, need, they, they will sleep in these rooms. We have former camp victims testifying that they take turns to lay down and sleep at night because look at how overcrowded those rooms are. And when they are sitting or standing, they were all packed and imagine how they're supposed to sleep in these rooms. And this is a video clip of shaved head, blindfolded and the shackled, the Uyghurs being transported via the train on the right, you see, it reminds you of pictures from the Holocaust, the World War II. But these are happening today in 21st century in the information era on your watch. And some of the things that can target you in, in our homeland and those people in the concentration camps, because some of them taken for having a beard or wearing hijab or speaking the Uyghur language at schools or workplaces or refraining someone from drinking alcohol or smoking because it's uh, not acceptable in our religion or just using WhatsApp on your phone or traveling to any of those um, 57 Muslim majority countries, including Turkey and any of the Central Asian countries or going to Saudi Arabia for pilgrim or fasting during the Ramadan or just simply going to the mosque and pray because entire religion is being criminalized and the, every single aspect of the religion is outlawed. So anything you do that you are being called as radicalized Islamic extremists. And those are the brave camp victims that they are speaking out. They are testifying what they have been through and what the, the victims, the, the inmates in the camps are subject to, how they are subject to 
um, political indoctrinations, forced to forsake their ethnic identity and religion, and subject to mental and physical torture, a systematic mass rape and the sexual torture, and they are forced to take unknown medications and food and sleep deprivations. And those pictures on the top, the picture, if you can see, I don't know how clear it is, the one in the middle on the right, that woman is at least 80 some years old, that grandma, and the police are taking her away because she prayed at home. And the, the lady on the uh, left, the police are coming in because they, they and they found some uh, cultural and religious books from her home. I'm sure she disappeared that night. This is a before and after picture in the same location. The one on the right is now. Same place on the left. Once people used to come right after sunset, that sunrise in the morning with their goods and the food and the all kinds of um, the hobbies, uh, you know, the crafts that they made. And the, uh, spend all day there trading, selling, cooking, or just the sitting and the chit-chatting, and then go home after sunset. They spend all day there, the ones that not working in the farm and the ones that coming for, you know, um, farmer's market or any kind of uh, uh, selling the goods that they produce. But now, what happened to the people? Where did they disappear to? Uyghur women's bodies are being the battleground in this genocide, while they are subject to the government-sponsored mass rape. Most of the men are taken to the concentration camps. The Han Chinese, the Chinese men are sent to Uyghur homes to live inside of their houses, supervise and monitor their daily lives. The Chinese state media reported, this is back in early 2019, and that there is an article, and they proudly announced that 1.1 million Han Chinese men sent to Uyghur homes to supervise them and give them credits after a couple of weeks of homestay. Most men are taken to the concentration camps. What do you think happened to those women when the men are sharing the beds with them? While they're moving the Uyghur university students or anybody who could work on production, to China proper to work as forced laborers, they are bringing Han Chinese men, offering them free health care, free housing, jobs, and the money. Adrian Zanz, Dr. Zanz, analyzed the Chinese government's own data and they uh, released a report in 2020 to show that the Uyghur population has been forced to undergo sterilization and the uh, uh, mandatory birth control and the forced abortions. And now the natural population growth rates have been heavily plumbed in the Uyghur majority counties and the, uh, the areas and regions. As I mentioned earlier, I am speaking to you today. I am doing my advocacy work at the cost of my own sister's freedom. Here she is, kind, generous, very soft-spoken and law-binding citizen who has been living in Urumqi and retired in earlier age due to health reasons. She was taken on September 
2018, six days after I did my first public speech, participated on a panel in one of the think tanks here in Washington, DC. I spoke on September 5th, 2018, but six days later, the Chinese government took my own sister. Ever since she disappeared almost four years ago, we have no idea where she's being held at. We don't know what kind of health situation she's enduring there. Be honest with you, I don't even have proof of life. I have no idea if she's still alive. The one in the middle is my niece. And it, instead of raising her own kid, four years old daughter, now my niece is advocating for her mother's release. The Chinese government announced that Uyghurs graduated back in December 2019, but I'm still missing my sister. Akida is still missing her mother, and Bahram is still missing her fa his father, Kurba Mamu. And everybody, all the Uyghurs in diaspora, still missing their loved ones. So we did a campaign, still no info hashtag, and we were very active in social media. And I was carrying my sister's picture everywhere, protesting in front of the Chinese embassy, going to Geneva, protesting in the United Nations, front of the United Nations. And I was speaking to the media. And after I was being so vocal about my sister's disappearance, this is what I got. The Global Times Network, Chinese state-owned media, did a, uh, a report and called me, if you look at here in the second paragraph, for example, Luciana Bas, leader of the so-called Campaign for Uyghurs and such and such, said they first stole some Uyghurs photos and the information claimed these people to be missing relatives in Xinjiang, spread rumors about China. Imagine, I mean, that is my sister, my sister's picture. Yet they accuse me for stealing other people's photo. And then Li Jianzhao, who is the deputy um, director in the Chinese foreign ministry, he blocks me first on the Twitter, so I cannot see his tweet. Somebody took the screenshot and sent me. And then he tweeted with my picture and calls me CIA asset and also um, attacking spreading libel against my work in Guantanamo, where I translated for 22 innocent Uyghur people brought to Guantanamo to figure out who they are and what they are during the Bush administration. And I was in Guantanamo for 11 months translating for them until our government cleared them and they resettled them in third countries. And then in December 2020, we heard that my sister was sentenced 20 years in jail on the terrorism related charges. So we did a press release at the uh, Congressional Executive, the, together with Congressional Executive Commission on China on the December 30th, 2020. And many congressmen, representatives spoke and demand for my sister's release. And then December 31st, 2020, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Van Bin, when one of the Reuters reporter asked about my sister, he spells it out. Gulshan Abbas was sentenced to jail by Chinese judicial authorities for crimes of participating in a terrorist organization, aiding terrorist activities, blah, blah, blah. Well, which one? Am I a liar? Stealing other people's photo? Spreading rumors about my missing sister? Or now you are calling my sister a criminal? Which one of your lies that you are going to stick with? As we all know, the Chinese government is not only getting away with this genocide, 
but being rewarded by some of the international entities. Most recent one is International Olympic Committee rewarded China with the Winter Olympics. So the China Commission did a, a tweet every day with um, hashtag Olympic prisoner and some of the people, as you see, um, being harshly sentenced and their crime is basically being Uyghur. Australian, um, one of the Australian Institute, uh, SP, Australian Strategic uh, uh, Institute, did a report. The name of the report is Uyghurs for Sale. Basically, more than 100 globally renowned companies in the world using Uyghur slaves in their supply chains. So, over 1 million Uyghur workers were transferred out of our homeland in just within three years between 2017 and 2020. And we have a uh, coalition and the Uyghur forced labor in China um, trying to call to action and the uh, contacting the fashion brands who are being complicit. But unfortunately, companies like Zara, Nike, Adidas, Coca-Cola, and the uh, Tesla and the others still continue to make profit off of Uyghur slaves' blood and the tears. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Many companies, all these companies, rightfully, they left Russia. But when it comes to Uyghur genocide, they choose to increase their profit margin by using Uyghur slaves and they stay silent and look away from China's genocide and being complicit. The genocide should be a red line. But many, many countries decide to just to take their short term economic benefits over the human dignity. The genocide motions are um, around the world, basically, United States and Canada and UK and the Lithuania, Belgium, Czech Republic, Dutch Parliament. Um, declared that uh, what's happening in our homeland is genocide. There are a few things that you can do. Um, visit our website, campaignforwigris.org, and if you can sign up on our uh, mailing list, you can receive updated information, our uh, press releases, and if you can donate to support our work, we appreciate it and also stand up against Chinese government's genocide by educating yourself and educate people around you. And we also established Congressional Uyghur Caucus. So if you can ask your representative to join our uh, Uyghur Caucus to support Uyghurs at the Hill, and also follow us on social media so you can support our work and also share the information. And I'm looking forward to the questions and engaging with you more. Thank you. Thank you, Rashan. That was really a, 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 fascinating, a fascinating history there um, and certainly means so much to you uh, for what you and your, your, your family and others have gone through. Uh, just tell us a little bit, though, about about your homeland when you were a little girl growing up, and what was it like there? Um, as I mentioned, it's beautiful land with beautiful people, peaceful, friendly. I was born and raised in Urumqi, the capital city, and basically I was born and raised and studied in Xinjiang University. I was born in there. I was educated there. I grew up there while my mother 
was a medical doctor at the university hospital. And my father was a chairman for the biology department in Xinjiang University. But the peak of the Cultural Revolution, which just started in 1966, you know, I was born in the right in the middle of it in the uh, 1967. So I, from like when I was a baby, toddler, or young child, I witnessed my parents being victims um, as a part of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, revolution uh, targeted attacks on the Uyghur intellectuals. I witnessed um, my grandpa was jailed for three years when I was like five years old. And I witnessed my father taken away for re-education camps. And my mother was also taken away from home for overnight political studies. So the entire time that I was living in my homeland, the Uyghur people were always being treated as a secondary citizens in their own land and always being, um, always, you know, facing a discrimination. So I came to the United States in 1989 after I graduated university as a visiting scholar at the Washington State University. Then I became a graduate student. Um, I was only 21 years old when I came to US, um, didn't speak any English, didn't know the culture, and the, um, so I, when I first came to US, um, I think that was just uh, only uh, six months or nine months, something like that. I watched the film, Children of the Lesser God, probably you remember, Rick. Mm -hmm. Also, it's a sort of a romance film, but that, that film made me think of my people back home. And I used to say that the Uyghurs are children of the uh, Lesser God. Interesting. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, the history of, you know, maybe in the in the eight, late 80s, 90s, there, there was perhaps some controversy, violent extremism or not, maybe uh, certainly in reaction to the Han Chinese occupation. But was there was there an extremist Uyghur movement originating in East Turkestan? Um, some people may be unaware of the U.S. Uh, U.S. government's, you know, detaining of some, uh, you know, Uyghurs at one time, perhaps mistakenly, but but take us through, you know, has the has the have the Uyghurs been an extremist group at all? No, not at all. That's exactly what the uh, Chinese Communist Party wants people to think. Chinese government uses the pretext of terrorism to um, militarize East Turkestan and to control the. Uh, just ordinary people. They opted the war on terrorism and the uh, under this cover, you know, they have continued to attack the Uyghurs. Um, during the 80s, right after the establishment of the diplomatic relations with the uh, United States in 1979 to 1989, the Tiananmen Square protest and the uh, massacre, we just had the anniversary of June 4th the June 4th Tiananmen um, Square uh, massacre, until those, uh, like those 10 years, during those 10 years, we had a little bit of freedom. So we did some protests. Um, for example, I am actually one of the uh, student um, leaders who uh, organized uh, those protests in 1985 and 1988, university students. Then later, after the uh, Soviet, collapsed down in the early 90s and establishment of the uh, Central Asian Republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and those are our brothers and sisters basically and the neighboring countries. We speak same language, uh, we have same religion, and we have same history and the culture. So all of a sudden, after the uh, uh, Soviet collapse down and the establishment of uh, the former Russian stands, the Uyghurs became separatists. And then right after 9-11 tragedy in the United States, in overnight, Uyghurs became terrorists and China claimed to be the victim of the uh, war on terror. I mean, um, you know, they claimed that they are a victim of terrorism. I recall I was in the United States then, um, 
in 2001, right before the 9-11, China was admitted to the World Trade Organization. And then they were producing all kinds of videos inviting the foreign companies and foreign investors to come and invest in Xinjiang. And they were saying, peaceful place with friendly Uyghur people and come and invest. And then a few weeks later, when the 9-11 happened, all the Uyghurs became terrorists. Um, I translated those 22 Uyghurs in Guantanamo detained by the US in Afghanistan because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, because they were refugees in Central Asia, but after the Shanghai, um, Shanghai Five, you know, Shanghai uh, uh, Corporation Organization, um, the Uyghurs in Central Asia were not safe if they were, their passports were expiring. The Chinese government uh, will ask those countries to um, have those countries to deport them back. And once they arrive, they will be sent to the jail. So they don't want to go back to China. And where, before 9-11, where in the world, one country that didn't care if you have valid passport or valid visa, as long as you are Muslim, that was Afghanistan. So they went to Afghanistan because of necessity as refugees, because they didn't want to go back to China and they couldn't get visa to come to the Western countries or Turkey. So they ended up in Afghanistan. But then after the US brought them to uh, Guantanamo, they were cleared. They were um, noted as non-enemy combatants, not threat to US and its allies. And they, they were resettled to third countries. Got it, thank you. A very, a very, uh, a, a small, but very important piece of your history. Um, on a larger basis, um, and, and you have investigated and certainly your, um, your, your, your countrymen have experienced it, but tell us about the, the Chinese government's sort of larger campaign of propaganda, myths and disinformation, and other methods it uses on, on, again, a more generalized basis, you know, in all cases around the world. What have you, what have you learned about, about their reach and, 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 and some examples, perhaps? Yeah, the Chinese Communist Party um, has been uh, running a uh, complex and the relentless uh, propaganda and disinformation campaign against the, uh, the rest of the world um, to discredit Uyghurs, Uyghur activists, or their allies and to promote their narrative that uh, there's no genocide, no human rights violations, and the Uyghurs are living happy lives, and it's all lie, and it's what the West is producing against China. And of course, as you saw in my PowerPoints, calling people like me as a CIA asset, and the, uh, we are all liars, but in reality, who's lying? The Chinese government is constantly lying about everything. When first, when we brought up those concentration camps in uh, early 2017 and 2018, the Chinese government completely denied, denied of existence. Basically, they said, no, no such a thing, absolutely nothing like that, and that those are all lies. And then after overwhelming evidence of satellite imageries, victims and the witnesses, and the scholars' research, and also the Chinese government's own data being leaked. Then they said, oh, those are re-education centers. A few months later, they changed the story and they said, those are vocational training, teaching them job skills. So many people, including the Chinese population, actually, not just the within China's borders, but even the Chinese people who is living outside of China, even in the United States, they believe the, the CCP's disinformation and that they attack us actually. When I go to universities, give um, presentations, I have had the Chinese students attacking me, calling me a liar. And the, uh, uh, it happened at the uh, Denver University at UC Berkeley um, and the uh, Tufts University in Boston, you know, in several other places. So um, the evidence is overwhelming. 
that shows that uh, what the Chinese government is doing to us is a genocide. And the, uh, the evidence is not just the coming from people like myself, activists or victims' families, or former camp victims. And also we have um, three sets. Now the fourth with those pictures, we have four sets of Chinese government's own documents. And the, everything that it's showing for the uh, forced sterilizations, forced abortions, and forced labor, and everything is coming from the Chinese government's own data. So um, doesn't matter how many times the Chinese government uh, repeat their lies, the truth is truth. When, when you receive that opposition from, from Chinese students, um, do, do you believe that those, are, that those people, those students are um, instruments of the CCP or are they just regular students who are um, you know, under a different belief system? Um, it depends. Some of them just attack me, calling me a liar and uh, saying that, oh, the Uyghurs are extremists and the Uyghurs are uh, killing the Han Chinese people during the Urimji massacre and this and that. Well, Urimji massacre, 40,000 Uyghur youth disappeared. And that was actually, a, you know, just a set up um, uh, by the, the Chinese government. But uh, things like that, when they bring up questions like that, I believe that they are just being victims of the Chinese government's disinformation and the false propaganda. But when someone from the Denver University and someone in UC Berkeley or someone in Vienna, Austria, or someone in Paris at the university in, in Paris, France, they all repeat exactly same talking points what the Chinese government is saying, then I would believe that uh, those are sent by the Chinese embassy or consulates to uh, disturb my presentation. Got it, got it. Tell us about the, you know, the, your, your, um, your opinion of, of the US corporate community's response um, and, and its um, continued involvement in uh, East Turkestan has the, um, the UFLPA, uh, the Forced Labor Act, you know, made a difference? And, and are, you seeing, are you seeing change? Well, very sadly, um, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, you know, how those uh, uh, businesses left Russia right away, and then they are all in China, continue to support China's economy to continue the genocide, murder more people. Not just that, but they are making profit off of the Uyghur slaves and making China's genocide a profitable venture. That really saddens me. But then again, you know, the issue goes beyond the borders of China, not only into the, the Uyghurs in diaspora, now abroad that the Chinese government is trying to control, but also Chinese government is trying, Chinese government is controlling the free thinking societies in the world actually. So speaking out against Chinese government's genocide and the speaking for Uyghur people, it's not just the attempt to help the Uyghur people or save Uyghur's future but also it is to save the free world and the freedom and the democracy of our world here, here at home, here in the United States. Because look at it, Hollywood, NBA, Disney, and the corporate America and the academia, celebrities and talk show hosts, those who are usually so vocal against any sort of social injustice. Remember when the Black Lives Matter, all these US corporates are so quick to speak out rightfully, they should, you know, any kind of social injustice, they should stand up. But then they're all voiceless today because perpetrator is China and the perpetrator has the money and the power. So willingly giving up your freedom of speech or freedom of expression because of the profit 
that they are making from China is a threat not only to the people in China, but also to the future of the freedom and democracy at the Western world here in America that people worked so hard to establish in the past 70 some years. So that's what's at stake, future of this free world. So it's, it really frustrates me. So the um, Uyghur Forced Labor Profession Act, which we worked so hard to get it passed because companies like Nike, Coca-Cola, and the others were actively lobbying against it to stop it. Um, now, you know, it's becoming a law is a, a massive success, as you mentioned in your uh, opening remarks, and thanks to the efforts of the, uh, the Uyghurs and the other supporters um, and the human rights organizations. Uyghur forced labor is a massive crime um, that is the uh, economic engine moving the Chinese government's genocide forward, actually. And it's set to go into effect next week, um, I believe on the 21st of June, at which point no Uyghur forced labor products should be coming in to United States. But the corporations have been some of the largest uh, obstructionists in getting the uh, bill passed, as I mentioned earlier. I'm sure they will be trying to undermine, trying to lobby again to weaken it or stop it. Um, Nike, Zara, Apple, and the, uh, you know, so many uh, large corporations who are using the or Uyghur uh, forced labor. I'm sure they have uh, uh, lobbyists will be working and trying to um, stop to implementation of the, uh, the, the, you know, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. One, one of the questions um, from our audience is, is regarding a, you know, a list of um, American companies that are using forced labor out of, um, out of uh, East Turkestan. If, if someone were to go to your website, do you have that list there or? Um, we should have that link. Um, I'm going to ask Barbara to do that, but uh, we have that. Uh, we, and we were forced labor. Um, Barbara can send it to the chat here. Um, there is a website that they, they can go and see all the companies. <laughs> Okay, yeah. We, we should have that too under our uh, advocacy resources, actually, yes. Yeah, another question was, um, you know, which companies lobbied against that legislation? So that it might be interesting to, to identify those. Um, Apple, Nike, Coca-Cola, Zara. I'm sorry, we are having really thunderstorm here, if you hear the noise. Um, yeah, Apple, Nike, Coca-Cola, Zara. Those are the, the, uh, the main ones, especially um, Nike and the uh, Apple. Interesting. Yeah. Um, do you see any um, positive changes towards the Uyghur situation coming um, with the upcoming 20th Chinese Communist Party Congress in the fall? Um, any, any moderation, any progress? No, we all witnessed what happened uh, several weeks ago in Shanghai. Uh, Shanghai is, uh, uh, in China, Shanghai is the oldest, most um, uh, culturally and the, uh, economically and intellectual wise, you know, the one of the, uh, uh, the elite city actually. People are very well educated. If the Chinese government can use uh, the COVID, uh, coronavirus, and the lockdown people like that, the weeks and the weeks, and cause people killing themselves, throwing themselves from the, uh, uh, you know, high rising buildings. And the, uh, um, there are rumors about the eating people, people eating people, and all kind of horror and terror happened just the, just on the whole world's watch recently. I don't expect um, any kind of positive changes coming out. The CCP needs to go basically. And not only, as I said, not only for the people in China, within China's borders, but I worry for the future of this country, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I left my homeland when I was 21 years old in 1989. 
I left my beloved parents, my siblings, my only sister, my friends, my beautiful homeland. And when I came, I came for the freedom and democracy, which most people take for granted in this country. But now I know how um, that's being threatened actually. So I know how it is like to be live under an authoritarian regime. And recently whole world watched what happens if we continue to appease a dictator. We all saw what Russia did against Ukrainians, Russian invasion. That is an ample example of what happens when we continue to um, appease an authoritarian regime and refuse to take action or hold them accountable. So what China's doing to Uyghurs can be seen as a pilot program and they are testing ground for what they wish to do to the world. So again and again, you know, I feel like I am being broken records here, but we are witnessing today is not just about the future of the Uyghurs anymore. And the, uh, that's not something that's happening thousands of kilometers away on the other side of the Pacific and nothing to do with us. But China is a threat to the world, to the freedom and the democracy. This is about the threat to our fundamental rights. Yeah. In many countries, and many international entities, including the United Nations Human Rights Council and the people like Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for the Human Rights Council, already give up their freedom of speech and they, they already give up their human dignity and they allow the regime to buy them out or manipulate them or silence them using whatever they are using over them. So the governments and corporations have turned a blind eye to um, China's genocide for the prospect of short-term gains or personal gains. They are not just giving up their freedom of speech currently, but eventually what they are giving up is their sovereignty in the long run. Yeah, what a, what a personal journey and, um, and description of, of this greater threat that we that we have uh, in today's world, both certainly both internationally, but here domestically as well as you, as you refer to, Rashan. I want to thank you so much. Um, we're really we've run out of time, but thank you so much for a for a great program today. Um, and uh, thanks again to um, all of you who have joined us, to our audience today for being with us. Um, it's these type of programs which provide real world insight into global issues and the personal experiences and, and, and ex perspective of those involved um, that really help uh, the World Affairs Organization of Orange County bring value and, and knowledge to our Southern California community. Um, and speaking of that, and to help uh, continue to provide quality programming at, uh, at nominal cost, uh, please donate to support our mission. Um, as you might imagine, there's a donate button on, on the bottom of our website and we're ever grateful for your generosity, as I know the campaign for Uyghurs will be um, as well. Um, we have a great slate of programming um, in progress and that will soon be coming up. Um, one of which is a um, uh, premium uh, trustee uh, level event uh, to announce the um, uh, appointment of, of our new president of the World Affairs of Orange County. Uh, that will be occurring on uh, Thursday, June 23rd. And there's a number, we have a number of other events um, uh, in progress for, for both July and then uh, in the fall. Typically we'll uh, take off um, August um, during, the, during the last of the summer months. Um, and then as well, uh, the uh, World Affairs Councils of America National Conference is in November. And that's um, for anybody who's interested is something that uh, staff and ourselves can provide you with more um, information all as well. Um, so thank you again, Rashan. Thank you to the audience. Um, that um, 